Good morning, church. Please remain standing. It's good to see you all today, those who are watching online. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Today we'll be reading from Mark chapter 2. If you're using a church Bible, it will be on page 837. Uh, in this passage, we learn that Jesus has authority not only to heal the physical disease, but he has authority to forgive sins. He has authority to remove guilt, to remove shame. So please follow along as I read Mark chapter 2, starting from verse 1. And when he returned to Capernaum, after some days it was reported that he was at home, and many were gathered together, so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them, and they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him, and when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, Why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, Why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise, take up your bed and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, Rise, Pick up your bed and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw anything like this. And this ends the reading of God's word. You may be seated. If this is your first time here, we want to welcome you. Please stop by the Welcome Center to receive a gift. Uh, you can ask, get more information there, too. Uh, we also ask you to fill out these connection cards, put as much information as you feel comfortable. This is the way for us to reach out to you. If you're a regular attender, we also ask you to put your name down, that way we know you're here. If you have any uh, prayer requests or questions, you can write them in the back of the cards. Uh, the cards can be dropped off at the white boxes by the doors. Uh, also, you receive the uh, worship guide today, and in the back we have some announcements, so please take a look at that if anything stands out to you. And now we'll have Pastor Todd come share the message. Good morning. Good morning. Let's pray together. Father, we love you today. We bow before you to ask you to do only what you can do for those watching, for those that will see and hear this week, for us here. We ask you to heal us in ways we do not even know we need to be healed. And do it in such a way that people will say what we just heard. We've never seen anything like this before. God's people said, Amen. Jesus is going around proclaiming the kingdom of God. He is not proclaiming the church. The church comes out of the kingdom. He's not proclaiming a denomination. He's not proclaiming some group is better than another. He is not taking political sides. He is not taking military sides because he is saying everywhere he goes that he has come to take over, not take sides. The kingdom is a radical transformation of life where you surrender yourself to the living God who came for you, who had created you, loved you for all eternity, came for you, lived a righteous life, died, rose again, and claims everything about your life is His. Everything. Sexual, financial, marriage, relational, how we parent, how we treat friends, how we forgive people, the words that come out of our mouth. The kingdom is all-encompassing. He promises he promises that he will empower you in a way that you will be amazed 
of the supernatural life. This book, this king, is unapologetically supernatural, not natural. Jeremiah, he said, you just asked me to Jeremiah, I will show you great and mighty things which you would never have known unless you asked me. That's what Mark is proclaiming. Stephen McDonald on your screen, that's what he proclaimed. He went up to three young boys. As a cop, a policeman, he had got a message that a bike had been stolen. He went up to ask the boys about the bike. The 15-year-old with them turned and shot him point blank in the head, the neck, and in the arm. Stephen spent 18 months in the hospital, the rest of his life paralyzed. But he said he did not want to stay paralyzed in his heart. He said, wheelchair is okay. Wasn't what I asked for, but it's okay. But I, I don't want to be paralyzed in my heart. So he made bigger news than a 15-year-old shooting him when he went public. And he forgave the young man and asked other people to do so. They called him God's cop. He said, I, I don't know about that, but he said, I'm glad... God has hold of my life. I don't know where I'd be without him. He wrote, looking back, pondering on my life since that time, it's clear to me that God has always been in charge. He wanted to use me, so he brought me to a place that I would say yes, in a hospital bed for 18 months. Through family and friends that God put in my life, their prayers, the way they loved me, God spoke to me and said, will you love this boy who shot you? The best way that I knew to love him was to forgive him and publicly forgive him because left to my own abilities, I would not have been able to do it. I would have stayed paralyzed. I know that I would have died a long time ago had I not said yes to the Lord, followed the example of his son, and loved this young man and forgiven him. Stephen, the son of this policeman, who's now who was a New York police sergeant for years. He said, my parents created a phenomenal life out of darkness and brokenness. What God did in them showed an unmatched, unconditional devotion to love God and love each other that I have witnessed from the beginning of my life. In other words, in brokenness, I saw life. I saw beauty. I saw glory he never would have expected his dad to be in the hospital 18 months. His dad paralyzed the rest of his life. But he said, in it, my dad didn't stay paralyzed. He didn't stay paralyzed. He said he was freer than a lot of people walking around. That, that's what Jesus is proclaiming. So while he's walking around, he is fulfilling over 300 prophecies of the Old Testament that we've had written down for over 2,000 years. Isaiah 35, 6 Let's read it together. You ready? Then shall the lame man leap like a deer, the tongue and the mute sing for joy. So that's a long section of the blind will see, all that comes in Luke. You remember Luke 4? He says all these. It, it was Isaiah said it 700 years before Jesus was born. Isaiah said he would die on a cross about 400 years, 500 years before a cross was ever invented to crucify people. He said when he comes... One of the things that will happen is the lame will leap like a deer. So I showed you a calf coming out of a stall last week. Here's a deer, just to remind you what he's picturing of the gospel. So here's the picture. When I save you, you will leap like a deer, and he says, in wide open spaces, you won't be caged in, even when people are trying to cage you in. You won't be caged in. You'll be in wide open spaces, even in some of the worst spaces. You'll be in wide open spaces like a deer leaping with joy in some of the worst spaces. Or this gospel doesn't work. It's baloney. It's foolishness. Or it is real and you can leap like a deer with joy in some of the worst places. Mark, he says, if you've got your sheet in front of you, he says, 
We're to bring the broken to the Lord. So Mark has a very simple message. And this paralyzed man represents somebody who's broken in spirit, not, not just physically. And he says, our job as kingdom people is to point people, bring people to the Lord. Jesus is back home. He's probably staying in Peter's house. So much ministry in the Gospels is done in the home. As we break loose and get going and move outward, I hope we'll have more people inward. We can't raise a man up from a, a, a cot, a paralyzed man, but it is amazing how much healing can happen in a home through ministry, love, prayer, serving. He's back home. He's back in ministry in his home. Verse 1, he returned to Capernaum, and it was reported that he was at home. It's amazing that he had any margin in his life. I find that hard to have margin, you know, just to, to be with people, to sit still, to linger. But he's, we see again, he's working from the morning on, from the early morning till late at night, healing people, feeding people, serving, teaching. But he has some margin in his life. He's back home. They find him. Verse 2, many are gathered there. There's not even room at the door. He's proclaiming the word to them. So it reminds us today to ask, where can people gather? They certainly, we certainly can gather here. We've got 30 days to Easter. Isn't that incredible? Snow's melted. Sun's out. It's up to 27 degrees. Balmy, if you're watching in Florida, balmy here. And when global warming takes over, you won't be able to afford our property. There'll be no way because we have a lake and so much beauty. But it's 27, it's sunny. We're going out. Got 30 days or so to Easter. Who's your one? Who's your one? Who, who can you bring in to the crowd here? But where else can you go to a crowd? Maybe he's leading you to coach a baseball team or football team. Maybe he's leading you to teach English as a second language. Maybe he's leading you to serve at a school or a local ministry or join an organization where you can be around people that aren't like you and aren't like me. Maybe that's what he's calling us to do. Pray about it. Jesus is constantly with the crowd. Do you notice here that it says in verse 2, he was proclaiming the word, not a word, the word. It is the definite article every single time. It is the word. It's God's word to mankind that God heals people and changes people. He's proclaiming the word with his life and with his speech. And so that's another question. How can you and I proclaim the word to people? How can we start conversations? How can we speak? I, I, I was with some people. I didn't know them very well a couple of weeks ago. And while the people were complaining and a, a sister in Christ said, you know, I just read from God's word, be thankful in all circumstances and rejoice always. I, I just want to tell you, it's a, it's a good time to rejoice. The person went dead silent, but I thought, yeah, may her tribe increase. May her tribe increase. She proclaimed the word. It might be a second or two. That you plant a seed. It might be that you come alongside your children and read a book now towards Easter. It might be for the first time you, you say in C group or D group, hey, I'd like to take a turn. It might be that you're led to teach, proclaim somewhere, I, I don't even know, but he went around proclaiming the word. There's no bait and switch with Jesus. He didn't start a church and say, we're going to make it all cool and bring people in and not talk about me. And then later on, we'll tell them what it's really about. Everywhere he goes, he's out in the open. No, I'm the Lord. You better hate your, your mother, your brother, your sister, your father, your child compared to me. I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going to play second to anybody. He is clear about the word. Verse 3 they came, which means a crowd. You saw that in the video. A crowd came, and the crowd is at the door, and they're bringing a paralytic, and four men carry him. But it's a larger group that are there. Verse 4, they, they couldn't get near him, so they removed the roof and 
They made an opening and let down a bed. Can you imagine that happening right now? I mean, is somebody cutting the roof open or at your house? First thing we probably think about is, do we have insurance? But who is that? What's going on? There's a sense of amazement. Wow, stunning. Ah, but what, what kind of love these men have? The story quickly goes to four men who have an incredible love for this man. I was thinking about Tiger Woods again this week, and I, he's on my mind constantly lately. I've been praying for him, and I was asking the Lord, just give him four friends that love Jesus, or at least one. He could benefit from somebody like this who will, who will not stop, who will not stop till they get him to the Lord. These men wouldn't stop. They wouldn't stop. They, they go after it. They carry him for some amount of ways. We don't know. It's certainly hot in, in this area of Palestine. They go after him and get him. They take him however long it is. They fight through the crowds. They can't get through. They go up on the top. The, the roofs would have been flat, so you usually had another place to fellowship, to live. So they tear the roof apart. And here's what they do. If you sum it up, they place this broken man in the presence of Jesus. It's that simple. Maybe you're called, I'm called this week to place somebody in front of him in prayer, conversation, point them to him, place them in front of him. That's, that's all they know to do and they won't stop. So we got one month to Easter, we're going to bless people. You know the acronym, we're going to be praying. We're going to be praying for people. If you join in, we could literally have hundreds of people online and here praying for someone to get their life changed by the time Easter comes, between now and Easter. They would publicly proclaim Christ and God's going to put somebody on your heart. There's a man right here sitting in front of me. He took this up the last time we talked about it. He said, I've, I've heard you say it. I've heard you say it. He said, I decided to live it out. I wrote it down. He began praying and he was at work one day, and a man had some troubles, and he said, may I pray for you? He said, first time I've ever done it at work. He said, I put my hand on his shoulder, and I prayed for him, and he said, I could tell afterwards I embarrassed him, and he said, Satan, the enemy came to me, and he said, I'll never do that again, you know. That was a, that was a bomb. About three or four days later, the man came back, the man he'd prayed for, and he said, the man said, I think your prayers are working, and he told him what was happening. He came to me, and he wanted to encourage me, and he says, God does work. He does work. Who does he want you to pray for? Just be praying. Ask God to do what only he can do. Listen well. Listen well to people. Let's don't push our thoughts, our politics, our policies, our agendas, our sports team. Let's don't push the things that don't matter. Let's engage and talk and Share and ask questions, but let's listen well. I think one of the reasons why Jesus listened so well was he was confident in himself. He didn't listen and wait to have his turn, you know. He, he was confident in himself, and he listened. He listens well. Proverbs 20, verse 5 says, A person's heart is like deep waters. A man of understanding learns to draw it out. All the stuff people talk about usually are surface things. And it's like the Titanic, the ship. You remember it? They said it was unsinkable. Even God couldn't build a better ship. It's going along and it hits an iceberg. The top of the water hits an iceberg. And it rips the metal apart and takes the screws and bolts off. It wasn't the top that was the problem. It was bigger than most mountains. It was what was under the water. People who listen get to hear what's under the water. They get, we get to hear what's really there. And then third, we're going to eat with people. Oh, can I, remind, can I ask you something just quickly? Just came. Ephesians 4.29. Would you write that down? Ephesians 4.29. It says, let no unwholesome word come out of your mouth, but only what is good for building people up according to the need of the moment that you give grace to them. Ephesians 4.29. Really worth thinking about. We're going to eat with them. I got to eat with a man at a restaurant recently, 
And he got upset and he said some words I haven't heard since my grandmother got scratched by a cat. She, he, he said some things, I mean, right out in the open. And uh, he apologized and I, I said, you know, you know, it's okay. It's okay. We'll, I'm just glad to be with you. I was going home and I was thinking about it and I was laughing and smiling that God had put me with somebody that is radically different from me. He thinks different, talks different, lives different. But that's hard for me to get out of the bubble sometimes. Some of you live around it. Some of you like to not hear the words anymore. But it was like, yes, he put me with somebody that needs me. You'll never have any greater joy than God use you in ministry, ever. And to lead somebody to know Christ. Ask him for these 30 days at least. Ask him. If you're reading the book on revitalization, the devotional 40 days are being revitalized. We've got them in the back there. It's over and over and over. Be revived in the Lord and his mission. The Lord and his mission. Go to all the world. Go to all the world. We're going to serve them. There's so many ways I hear about you serving people, but I, I really especially want to thank those that are in the meal ministry. You've been serving a couple of families for months on end that have cancer and have some real severe problems. Thank you. Find some way. Find some way to serve somebody and then speak the good news. Somewhere, somewhere, God will open up a door for you to say, may I tell you what God has done for me? Speak. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. Just Just speak. Jesus' last words on earth should be our first priority. His last words were go proclaim the word, make disciples. Last words should be our first priority. Baptisms are coming up. We're going to baptize a young man, Lord willing, on Palm Sunday. We're going to baptize several others on Easter Sunday. If you, if you have never proclaimed the Lord yourself through baptism, I pray that you'll sign up to be baptized. We'd like to meet with you, pray with you, and that you'd go public and be baptized. I was baptized as an infant. You were baptized, many of you in this area, especially as an infant. But now it's time maybe to proclaim your faith, not your parents' faith or grandparents. Your faith. Your faith in Jesus Christ, risen from the dead. That you'd be bold enough and willing enough to stand up in front of people and say, I follow Jesus Christ. He's my Lord. He, he's my Savior. He changed my life. I, I, wonder, I wonder what this paralytic's baptism was after Pentecost. After the Holy Spirit came, and in Acts 2, it says thousands of people were baptized. He had to be one of them. He comes to know the Lord. We're going to see that in the passage. I wonder what his baptism was like and what his testimony was like. You may not have that kind of testimony. I don't. I, mean, I can't say I was... I was in bed for years, paralyzed, and he raised me up. But I can say I was paralyzed with insecurity for years. I was paralyzed by fear for years. I was paralyzed by selfishness for years. You got a testimony. Make it public through baptism. Don't be ashamed of Christ and go public with him. Tell everyone you're a follower of Christ. Well, they they bring this broken man to the Lord, and then Mark wants you to see something else. We're to seek the Lord for who he is and what he does. And Mark makes this presentation, message, very simple of what happened. Jesus is going around proclaiming the kingdom of God. He is proclaiming who he is and what he does. Verse 5, he, Jesus saw their faith. He said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. So this is the turn in the gospel. This is where the lines are drawn. And from this passage on, his enemies are going to chase him to the cross because of this phrase, I forgive your sins. I forgive you. Ultimately, Jesus said, ultimately everything you've done to every person was ultimately against me, your creator. This is not a person who's claiming to be a prophet or a good guy or a nice person. He is making it clear that everybody understands he is God in the flesh. I forgive your sins. You notice the word son? It's an endearing term, of course. I love my mom or dad to call me son. But it's an announcement. 
You're a child of God. You, you're, you've come into the kingdom. Your sins are forgiven. You're free. I wonder what this man's sins were. Was, was he an addict because of his pain? Was he a complainer? He had lustful thoughts. What was his sins? I can tell you one of them because we all live with it. I know one of them was this. If I could just walk, I'd never complain again. You ever said anything like that? If I could just get this job, if I could just marry, if I could just have life and be on the way, I'd never, I'd never complain again. And so he comes to be physically healed, and here's what Jesus does. He says to the man, you aimed way too low. You aimed way too low. I'm not here just to physically heal you. I'm here to make you healed. It means whole. I want to make you whole again. You, you're aiming way too low. You need so much more. Jeremiah 2.13 the Old Testament is summarized by this, that the people of Israel had committed only two sins, just two. They had forsaken the Lord, the spring of living water who gives life. And they dug their own wells, their own cisterns, but their cisterns, their wells, had holes in them. They forsook the Lord and said, this will satisfy me. She satisfies me. He satisfies me. This satisfies me. Food, drugs, alcohol, sex, rock and roll, neighbor, doesn't matter, job. They only had two sins. They forsook the one that could have satisfied them, and they said, I'll make up an idol which will satisfy me. And he pictures them drinking in a cistern that has leaked out, and they're dipping their cup in muddy water and drinking muddy water and saying, mm, boy, this is good. That's how blind and deceptive and foolish sin is. Mm, that, that's good stuff. You see on your screen, we were in Haiti. I told this years ago, but Rob Dunn, I was, saw him a few weeks ago. It reminded me that we were in Haiti. We might have been in the Dominican Republic. I think we were in a, in a Haitian was there, but this Haitian came and worked with us. And when it came time to get some water, there's this huge tanker, on a, a huge tank on the back of a truck. And he goes up and turns the spout. And just even turning the spout open, you could see the water look like sludge. So he fills his glass up, which you could see, and he fills it with the filthiest water. Well, we've all got water bottles. and So I'm asking Rob, what's going on with that? And he said two things stuck me. Really, I, I thought about it afterwards. I thought it's absolutely my life. It's my life without Christ. He said, one, he's used to it. Rob said, he's got antibodies and bacteria in his stomach. He said, don't go try that. It'll kill you, so don't do that, or you'll be in the bathroom for several days. You can't, you can't drink that water. I wouldn't have done it anyway, but don't do that. He's used to it. And he said, second, that's all he knows. That's what happens. You get used to it. That's all you know. And you build up an immunity to the conviction. And you keep drinking the dirty water. He said, my people only had two sins. So that makes me with another question. Had these four men drank from the living water? I think they had. I think they'd come to know Christ. It says their faith. They already had faith. I think they had heard him, put their faith in him. I think they drank from the living water and they couldn't stand it. They could not stand it that somebody else that they loved didn't have what they have. That's the only way we'll evangelize, proclaim the good news. If we can't stand it, that somebody else doesn't have what we have. And so they take him and they take him to the Lord and they say, here he is. And they just plop him down. That's just, it's a good way to do it. It brings up one more problem. If you know anything about the Scriptures, everyone who comes to the Lord must repent and confess openly, believe. You must turn around, repent of your sins, and confess, believe in Jesus Christ. And He does not. 
Here's what I think is happening. I think he's like the prodigal son. You remember the prodigal son? He, he told his father, I wish you were dead. I, I'd like to have my money now. He goes out. He sleeps around, has sex, drinks, parties. Ends up eating the food that somebody dumped in for the hogs. He jumps over the fence, grabs the food, eats it. He's so, he's so much, he's starving, hungry. He spent all of his money. And then he tells himself, I'm going to go home. I'm going to go home. My, the, my dad's servants are treated better than this. I'm going to go home and I'm going to apologize and I'm going to ask for forgiveness. And on his way home, the dad does something scandalous. The story is meant to offend people. Jesus just makes it worse and worse and worse as he tells it in his culture. And he says, a Jewish man pulled up his robe, which you did not show your legs or body, and he ran to his son, a sinner, who was supposed to be disciplined or at least maybe even stoned, but at least set out of the community for seven days to become clean. And the father runs to him and grabs him and kisses him, this dirty, filthy boy, and gets a robe, which stands for a robe of righteousness, gives him a ring, which stands for full inheritance. You, you're not going to be a second-class citizen because you had sexual sin, spent money, ruined your life. You're a first-class citizen because you came back to me. And he kills the fatted calf, which meant the fullness of joy at dinner, but it was at a sacrifice. It had to be killed in his place. And the boy is practicing what he's going to say. You remember, he's walking and he's practicing. Here's what I'll say. Here's what I say. Here's what I say. But he gets there and he can't say it. Why? Because the father smothers him with love. He doesn't even get to say it. So <laughs> I think that's what happens here. He's in awe. He's overwhelmed. And the father, through Christ Jesus, has blessed this man so much that he doesn't even get to say much. The Lord showed who he was and what he does. That's, that's all we can give people. And it's enough. It's more than enough. Verse 6, the scribes are sitting there, the Jewish lawyers who, who taught the scriptures and taught how to live them out. They're sitting there. They're questioning in their hearts. You see at verse 7, why does this man speak like this? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? So they understood that he's claiming to be God, and he's the creator, and he can forgive. Blasphemy means you claim to be God or you claim to speak for God. It is, a, uh, uh, it is an offense that you would be put to death quickly. You would be stoned, and, or they would hand him over to the Romans. So they are saying, you shouldn't be here. You shouldn't speak this way. Verse 8, immediately Jesus perceives what's in them, and he asks them two questions. Here's the first one on your screen, why do you question these things? In other words, what's in your heart? Why, why can't you see what I'm doing when I do miracles in front of you? The problem is not me or the miracles. The problem is in your heart. Jesus is a master communicator. He says, can you tell me, Joe, Fred, Mary, Sue, Bob, Jonathan, can you tell me what's in your heart right now? What's going on in your heart that you do this? That's the first grader, what's in your heart. Then verse 9, he says, which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven or rise up, take the bed and walk. Now, it seems simple at first in our culture. Well, but it's not. Here's the second question, which is easier? So he, now he challenges them, he encourages them to think, which is easier? And here's what he's saying. It is exceedingly more difficult to forgive this man's sins than raise him up from being a paralytic. Because it will take me, the Lord, becoming what he is on the cross so he can become like me. It is exceedingly more difficult to die and take your sins than to raise you up physically. Verse 10, but big big transition that you may know remember he's speaking to the scribes his enemies you may, you may know that the son of man has authority on earth to forgive sins he said to the paralytic rise up pick up your bed and go home so every miracle in the new testament it's over and over seen that it's something bigger he's showing 
He doesn't heal everybody physically. And he has compassion on some. But the, all of them point to the fact that he can heal your soul. He can heal what's empty between you and the Lord. All of these. I love that, that you may know, even his enemies, he would turn to them. Remember, he, he sent the leper back to the temple. He said, go tell my enemies, go tell the priests. Now, he says to them, that you may know the gospel. I'm going to do this in front of you, and I pray you'll see. It, everybody needs a friend like that, right? I mean, you need a friend like that, and I need a friend like that. There's going to be somewhere in your life where you're going to really mess up. And a true friend... He or she walks in when everybody else is walking out. Every person in here wants to be loved like this. When you're angry, when you're sinful, when you're foolish, when you're lustful, when you're self-centered. These people are all that right in front of him. And he says, I want you to know my mercy and goodness. Everyone wants to be loved like that. When you're not at your best. So he offers them grace. Verse 11, I say to you, he speaks to the young man again, rise, pick up your bed, go home. He gets up, they're all amazed, they glorify God, they say, we've never seen anything like this. Can I give you the gospel here real quickly, real quickly before we take communion? Mark is given the gospel in little tidbits. Here it is. Jesus must nail his legs to the cross so this man's legs can work. Jesus must have his heart broken so this man can have his heart explode with joy. Jesus must be isolated on the cross and say, Father, why have you forsaken me? So this young man can go back home and be with his mom, his dad, his family. He says, I'll take your place. As we take communion, honestly, is there anything paralyzing you? Anything paralyzing you? insecurity, anger, fear, sin, anything? Would you hand it to him today, the one who raised the paralytic up to the floor? Would you give it to him? If anything's paralyzing you from having the joy of the Lord be your strength, hand it to him today. Please, please hand it to him. Father, thank you. Thank you for your faith that you put in us. Thank you for what you've done. As those at home leave us, I, I pray that they will take communion and confess. They will confess Christ as Lord through taking the bread and the cup, and reminding themselves who you are, Lord, and what you've done. As we prepare our hearts here to sing and listen, Lord, speak, move, work, heal, and do something that people will be amazed. God's people said, Amen.